today is Sven Alterman. Sven, how are you? Good morning, David. I'm very well. And you? I'm doing great. Start by saying congratulations on your new job and welcome to the team. <laughs> Thank you very much. It's very exciting. What are you, what are you doing? What are you going to be doing? Or well, this is a crazy time to join Microsoft because of all the quarantine and the stay at home things. Uh, but so I guess the question is, what will you be doing? Yeah, I am uh, a cloud solution architect in the education division, and uh, I will be uh, primarily focusing on tenancy. So we'll be helping our education customers with uh, migrating and deploying new workloads to, to the Azure cloud. Well, that sounds perfect for you because I know you, for years you were a college professor, right? That's right. Yes, I've spent about uh, a little over 13 years at Troy University as a lecturer and also as director of IT. That's so I've been on the other side of that of that equation. Uh -huh. So it's a shift, but you're taking a lot of that knowledge with you. That's right. That's right. I think that'll uh, be very useful. Yeah, and I, I know I was thinking about the when we uh, the day we first met, it was in uh, Orlando, I think. Yeah, I think so. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were in a competition that you were the judge, and you were the judge because you won the year yeah. before for Correct. talking about data, right? Yeah, that's that's correct. You're absolutely right. Yeah, I did a, a brief uh, presentation uh, in 2011 uh, at uh, <clears throat> at that conference um, on SQL Server file stream, which uh, okay. most people might have heard of, but. <laughs> Uh, most people have not heard of that, actually. Yeah. I, will, I will tell you for sure. <laughs> but uh, but your data is your thing, right? Even when you were in academics, you were really known. Yeah, for I I kind of consider myself to be a generalist, but but data is one of the things that that I dealt a lot with uh, while I was director of IT. We had we had a lot of data that we needed to manage uh, to uh, to help us uh, achieve accreditation, maintain accreditation, and, and just in decision making. I suppose like any other organization now needs to do. Is data used differently in education than in other industries? That's an excellent question, David. Probably not. Of course, some of the types of data that we deal with is different, like it would be in any industry, healthcare and so on. But in the end, the, the, the goal is, you know, how can we better uh, support our customers and internally make better decisions, right? And so at that high level, the, the purpose is, is pretty much the same. Um, and then in addition to some of the internal reasons, um, because education is in a way a regulated industry, um, you know, there's also compliance reporting that we need to do off of that data. So that's probably not something that every organization needs to do with their data, but, but again, not something unusual, even in other industries that might be regulated. Oh, what, what regulations require compliance in education? Well, <clears throat> When um, we're dealing, for example, at, at, at the university level, which, which I don't have that much personal experience with, um, you know, I was just in the college of business, but, uh, you know, there's financial aid data, for example. There's a lot of regulation around financial aid from, uh, from the federal government. And so uh, the, the, the college, the university, I should say, uh, the higher education institutions, they play a rather big role in, in awarding that financial aid. And, and it's actually the universities who are responsible for, uh, for checking the eligibility of, uh, of students to receive that financial aid and, and submit documentation. So, so that's one way in which actual regulation applies. And then um, at, at a different level, uh, it's not technically government regulation, at least it isn't in the United States, uh, but our accrediting agencies you know, they also require a good bit of data. And um, like I said, it's not technically a government regulation and not in the United States. And in most countries, actually, it is uh, the government who regulates higher education in the United States. It's based on accrediting agencies who, um, you know, who are, who are private uh, entities, uh, you know, kind of empowered by the federal government to uh, to make those decisions as to whether or not to accredit an institution. Uh, but those those require data as well. And that data goes on anything from learning outcomes to faculty qualifications, financials, uh, you know, so quite, a, quite a bit of uh, uh, internal data that needs to be uh, shared with those with those stakeholders. Oh, interesting. And there's probably a lot of privacy issues as well as you're sharing this information with students, with uh, uh, the banks, with the federal government. Yeah, absolutely. Those are those concerns are, are top of mind. And, you know, as you're talking about privacy, inevitably security, of course, enters enters the picture and higher education institutions are uh, a target uh, often for for hackers because of the vast throws of, of data that we have. 
Um, now, when data is being shared, obviously that uh, has to occur within within set frameworks. And for example, sharing data with accreditors isn't done at the student level, not at that level of granularity. That's all aggregated to much, much higher levels uh, of abstraction. But uh, yeah, some of the data, of course, that is shared with, with government uh, as it relates to financial aid uh, and, and some other compliance uh, uh, regulations is at the student level. And then other areas that uh, maybe people don't necessarily think about, even if they, when they were a student, might have been exposed to it. Uh, many universities, if not all universities that have uh, on campus uh, living, they also have a health center, for example. So, so now you're dealing with uh, health data. And uh, that, of course, uh, invites a whole different regulation uh, in the United States that would be HIPAA, of course, that would uh, would apply to that data. So, so there's uh, different regulations that uh, that apply to different types of data that the university deals with. Mm. What kind of tools did you use to manage this data? It had to be massive amounts. Yeah, um, so there's there's uh, <clears throat> some tools, of course, that are that are specific to, to education, the, the uh, ERP systems that educational systems, uh, educational institutions use. Uh, you know, we generally refer to them as SIS or student information systems. Uh, is, is the common term that's being used there. Those uh, vendors uh, manage a lot of that data. They have specialized data models that support that. Um, then there's uh, generally also those vendors or third party vendors will, will provide uh, in institutions with uh, data warehousing models um, or operational data models where the the operational data is uh, is extracted and, and stored for, for long term uh, evaluation and, and so on. Um, now, within the College of Business, which is what my role was, um, we of course relied on a lot of that institutional level data, um, but a lot of what we had to do too was very specific to what the College of Business did for a couple of different reasons. And uh, we actually used the off-the-shelf SQL Server and integration services to, to get some of the institutional data and, and, and data from our learning management systems, our LMS, uh, get that all together, uh, and then we use the SQL Server reporting services to, to report on it. Uh, mm -hmm. Now, more recently, of course, uh, Power BI is, a, is an attractive option for that as well. So while there are specialized software, specialized data models available, they, they often don't do everything that an institution needs, or at least not in the exact model that an institution needs. So many times there's some, some uh, custom work being done with, with off-the-shelf database management systems. Uh, yeah, you mentioned Power BI. Those are uh, tools. They do evolve. You said SSIS. I think a lot of people are using Azure Data Factory now as a sure alternative yeah. to that. Yeah. Uh, what about when you're teaching in the classroom? What does it? Uh, how does data affect that? Well, for for a lot of uh, for a lot of instructors, um, you know, they they might not see themselves as that necessarily, but they're they're in many ways they're data collectors. Right when uh, when they take attendance, for example, when they record grades, um, if uh, if they have uh, if they're most of our, most faculty, at least in the institution where I came from, are also academic advisors, so they advise their students on on their career path uh, and and on the uh, on the path through college, right? Uh, at, at, at the first level, really. So th they they are very much the creators of of the data and. Uh, like I said, I don't think faculty members necessarily think of themselves like that, but it, it means that they have a responsibility for, for data quality assurance in many ways, right? And uh, so that's that's something that um, that, that I kind of have, have tried to, uh, in, in my previous role, try to instill in faculty members um, that, uh, yes, you have your class to run, and that is absolutely their primary responsibility when they're, when they're with their uh, instructor hat or their teacher hat on. Right. Um, but, but what you're doing in there often has implications, you know, uh, for the college or for the institution, um, and, and trying to share that with them helps in, 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 in kind of uh, augmenting their, their vision <laughs> and, and, and understanding their responsibility in that, um, in that regard. What, uh, which classes did you teach? Well, at the, at the end of my time 
in higher education, I was really limited to teaching one course, uh, one course a year, and, and that was because of workload, not because I was doing such a poor job at it. But uh, well, <laughs> I, I wasn't going to ask that. I was. <laughs> I uh, that. But um, yeah, I, I taught the uh, cybersecurity class uh, in the information systems program. Okay, so you were uh, we were teaching your students about these uh, data concepts. I mean, yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. We uh, we we cover what well, we with uh, being in a business school. You know, we we always, uh, of course, inject a healthy dose of technology in into these uh, into these courses. But at the same time, we we certainly uh, addressed the, the business issues related to that, including, for example, compliance with regulations was a big part of that course. Risk management and, and so on. That's interesting. I actually, you know, I actually have an MBA. Uh, but it was I got mine before computers were invented. OK, so we didn't have to deal with that. <laughs> we had like uh, stone yeah. tablets and abacus. Right. Like <laughs> well, I know you're exaggerating now, but, but yes, I understand what you're saying. <laughs> it was a long time ago. <laughs> uh, what else should we talk about? I'm, I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm out of my questions. What's what what have we not covered that we should? Well, I think What's very important uh, to understand when you're thinking about uh, higher education and, and the use of data, you know, we've talked about some of the activities that, that the data is being used for that uh, are either very much internally, you know, making better decisions about certain things, um, but we haven't really delved into that, right? When you, when you think about that, in the end, most institutions genuinely want their students to succeed, right? I mean, all institutions that I've ever been in touch with, they want their students to succeed, right? We want our students, when they are admitted, you know, four, in some cases, five, or maybe more years later at the undergraduate level, but we yeah. want them to graduate, <laughs> right? That, that is the goal. Um, yeah, and, they want to brag about them afterwards. Well, exactly. That guy and say, hey, he went to, you know, I taught that fellow. I talk that lady. Exactly. Absolutely, absolutely correct. Uh, I mean, you know, when you go to a university, uh, university homepage, uh, you know, it's very rare that there won't be some feature story about one of their alumni. So that's a very good point, David. You're, you're absolutely correct. Um, it gives us bragging rights. But, you know, there's a lot of stakeholders that have, a, that have an interest in that. Right? Obviously, the student and the parents have an interest in, in making sure that, that they are successful. Uh, the federal government, from the financial aid perspective, the federal government doesn't just keep giving financial aid for, for students who don't, uh, who don't succeed. And uh, obviously our employers, um, you know, employers are big stakeholders in what we do. We, we wanna make sure, of course, that our programs meet their needs and, uh, you know, that, that, that the students actually get uh, what, uh, uh, what the employers expect them to get out of it. So. Um, so, so those are some of the stakeholders, but in, in the end, the student success is what matters, right? Is what I'm trying to get to. And so um, colleges now, uh, I think in the last, mm, I think maybe a year or two years, you've really seen um, an increase in, in projects that try to use data at the student level to really uh, help individual students be successful right so so not not at the aggregate level not say well 60 percent of our students you know uh, graduate in six years or 80 percent of our students graduate in six years but literally saying well john doe or or jane smith they are uh at this point in their program and what can we do to make sure that this student stays on track right and um, so a lot of projects uh, that uh, that, are, that are underway at, at, at many institutions, and it's, it's not widespread yet. I'm not going to say the majority uh, yet, but um, they are they are looking towards analytics and specifically predictive analytics right? uh, by by understanding student demographic data and whatever other data they have about the student that may be collected in a variety of of ways. And again, for example, through in in a course through the learning management system. Uh, using that data to understand what a student needs next. Because the, the one common thread that you find in virtually all institutions is that they understand that it needs high touch. That in order for students to be successful, it is, a, it is not an arm's length uh, a relationship that you can have with students. And again, especially traditional college age students, OK, maybe for adult learners who are going back for a master's degree or even 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 an initial undergraduate degree, the situation might be a little bit different, or at least their needs would be a little bit different. But if you're thinking about the traditional college age student who lives on campus, 
you know, what, what are the factors in their success? And, you know, there are obviously academic factors, right? Are, are they doing well in class? And what can we do to make sure that they are uh, coming in prepared uh, for, for each class that they're going to take? Um, you can also imagine, I'm certain, that there are financial factors that play a big role. Um, you know, not, not every uh, student uh, has the means when they start their program to really continue for four years. Some of them need to work and need, need additional financial aid. They might need student loans, you know, but those, those financial pressures weigh on those students and affect their success. And then another area uh, for those traditional students, probably more than any of the other categories of students that we have, is the social aspect. You know, for a lot of traditional college age students, they uh, and you know I think your kids have aren't that far out from from having been traditional college age students, but yeah, my kids uh, are both in their twenties. Yeah, so so not not that far out. Yeah, um, so they um, you know most of them arrive on campus. Uh, maybe they live in the dorms. Maybe they live off campus. But it's the first time they really lived on their own. Um, so their entire social experience is very different than what they've had um, un until uh, or through high school. Right. So, so there are there are those three main aspects that that are uh, affecting uh, student success. And um, you know, academics is is well, that's kind of obvious. You go to school, you got to do well, you got to get good grades, so you graduate. But but the other ones, the financial and social factors too, impact that academic success that that students can have. And so what what institutions are now trying to do is we're trying to say, well, what can we what do we know about individual students, and and what is it that might uh, for this student, which of these factors might be out of whack and might prevent that student from coming back next semester or next academic year and continue their program and eventually uh, graduate. So predictive analytics are, are becoming uh, an important factor in that. But like I said, you know, as an institution, knowing that is one thing then you have to actually reach out to that student and that's the high touch part of it right you have to mm -hmm. uh, you have to you have to have an involvement with the student you have to build a relationship with the student there could be different people in different institutions doing that obviously there are there are financial aid counselors for example that might come into role the academic advisors there might be professional academic advisors later on in the student's career the career services department for example might uh, might play a bigger role than, than than the financial aid department. So there are different departments at different points in time that can leverage the insights uh, from for particular students. Um, now you um, you left just as things were changing at the university. Uh, I'm I'm guessing that the the school you used to teach at is now doing online classes. Is that correct? So yeah, that high touch is is harder now, and the whole it, dynamic has changed. It is. Do you have any insight into how that's changing? Well, I'll, I'll say this. The institution where, where I was um, has had a long history with online education. As a matter of fact, oh. we consider ourselves one of the pioneers of online education. Now, that being said, it didn't mean that the transition was automatic. and that, yeah, But it was that probably easier than but some. It, but some it may have been easier, absolutely. Many of our faculty members um, you know, if you're talking about the high touch, I mean, the faculty member is certainly the person who who comes to contact with students the most, right? So many of our faculty members have experienced teaching online. And what that means, for example, is that they already have been trained that you can't just put some course material out there and tell students to go study it. No, you still need to regularly check in. You need to find ways to, to have students interact with you and with each other. Um, you know, to, to, to be part of that course uh, success. So I think I think where, where I came from, we did have it a little bit easier. Um, and, and in a way that that actually does go into technology, for example, right? Um, you know, do do your faculty members uh, have the technology skills and the equipment and the software to manage a completely online environment? And, and that's that's uh, something that I know institutions have have had to ramp up on. And again, not saying that didn't happen where I came from. <laughs> you know, it, it did. There were some faculty members who had not been teaching online. Uh, there were some programs that had not as many online um, uh, uh, courses as, as some other programs. You can imagine, for example, uh, music, teaching piano <laughs> to, to someone as some, some close friends of mine. Uh, you know, or in the music uh, department, and you know they're teaching piano uh, one on one essentially. Uh, right. You know, and that's that's a little bit tricky because there's no piano in the students' homes. So, 
Uh, it is, but I tell you, I, I learned to play the harmonica by watching YouTube videos. <laughs> <laughs> now, I can't play at the university professor level, but I can, <laughs> I can play a couple of tunes. Yeah. So, oh, so that, tell you, that technology does exist, but it's imperfect. It's, it's yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's it's absolutely possible um, to to do these things, right? But if you're unprepared for that, if you hadn't thought about how to do that, if you hadn't thought about how are we going to do it, then that becomes a then it becomes a problem, right? Uh, but yeah, absolutely, I believe it's possible for for a lot of uh, education, um, you know, to uh, uh, to be done remotely, even though we traditionally have been doing it face to face. Now, I will say this though, David, uh, the institution where I came from did not have a medical school, but I would rather not have a doctor operate on me if he's only watched YouTube videos. Is yeah. Uh... You say that, but I, I do know that um, I've been reading about this quite a bit lately is that there are a lot of doctors servicing remote parts of the world through the Internet where it's it's very difficult to travel there. And so uh, oh, they're absolutely. supporting they're sp supporting local medical professionals who maybe don't have expertise and teaching right. them that way. So, yeah, it's it's very imperfect, but sometimes it's better than nothing. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, well, excellent. You probably taught some online courses given your technical background. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I did. Yeah, I, I taught uh, the same course, the same cybersecurity course. And earlier on, well, uh, you know, I had a, I had a bigger teaching load uh, earlier on uh, while I was at uh, the institution. Uh, yeah, I did teach different courses online. Absolutely. Makes sense. And uh, of course, business college is one of the more popular schools at university right now. People. Uh, a lot of people gravitate towards that, mm -hmm. and sometimes there, there aren't enough professors to go around for uh, at least not in the traditional. If we only have you know thirty or forty students in a classroom, sure, absolutely, yeah. Scale, scale becomes an issue. <laughs> exactly, yeah. Scale, that's the worst. Uh, thank you for being the technical guy on this call. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever the conversation drags, you just always ask, "Will it scale?" <laughs> and you can just stop talking for a while. <laughs> All right, Sven, it's been wonderful talking with you. And uh, once again, congratulations on your new role. I, I, uh, I look forward. I hope you and I can work together sometime. Well, I, I'd like that very much, David. Uh, I've enjoyed this conversation very much. And, uh, and I look forward to, to, uh, to, to seeing you again and, and figuring out what we can do together. Thanks a lot. Stay safe. Thanks. You too, David. David, I'm glad that we were able to use this technology to keep up our friendship. I've enjoyed knowing you over these years, and I look forward to continuing our relationship, hopefully in person at some point after this lockdown is over. Thanks. <laughs>